So we are in our March series called March Madness. Um, if you're new here, this has nothing to do with sports, so don't worry about that. We are, we're talking about the Word of God. And, uh, you know, we typically do these series each month or most months because it gives a level of predictability for you. You know, when you're coming to church, you kind of know what you're getting into. You know what we're going to be talking about, and, and it gives you a way to even prepare yourself. And, but the irony about this series is that, you know, madness, talking about the madness uh, in the faith, uh, kind of goes against that. It's unpredictable sometimes, right? The, the premise of this series is that living out this life of faith, actually there's aspects of it, there's tenets of our faith that look like madness to the world if you're outside of this life of faith. And kind of the text verse that I've used over the last couple of weeks is out of 1 Corinthians 1 where it says that the message of the cross is actually foolishness to those who are perishing. Another word for that is madness. To those that don't know Jesus, a lot of what we do, the message of the cross itself seems like foolishness to those outside of that. And we, as believers, have to decide if we're going to try to blend in or if we're going to try to live the life of faith that God has called us to. We talked about the fact that the power of the cross 2,000 years ago still has power in our life today. And when you talk to somebody outside of faith, that seems like craziness, right? And last week we talked about how our weakness is actually a strength when it's put in God's hands. That sounds crazy too, because that's the opposite of what everybody outside of faith in Jesus would say. And today we're going to continue in that same vein of madness. And uh, I paraphrased my text verse over the last couple weeks because I have a different text verse I want to share with you this week. In fact, if you would please stand with me as we read God's word together. This, this verse is taken out of the Sermon on the Mount. It was the sermon that Jesus preached, greatest sermon ever preached in history, uh, often imitated, never duplicated. Amen. Uh, but I'm going to take some truth out of this and some of the madness that he spoke to us 2,000 years ago. Matthew 5, verses 38 to 46. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that's madness, that we would love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Some powerful, strong words from our Lord and Savior. The title of my message today is Loving the Unlovable. We're gonna talk about loving your enemies, so would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we love you today. We pray, Lord, today that you would reveal yourself to us during these next few minutes. God, we give you this time. We know that today and every day and every church service that it is all about you. But Lord, we are so thankful and so grateful because Though it's about you, you do your work in our hearts. And I pray today that each and every heart in this room and online, that our hearts would be good soil, that we would prepare our hearts in such a way that you'd be able to plant your seed in our hearts today, and it would produce in our life for our good, for your glory, for your honor, and for your fame. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. You can be seated today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we don't like to talk about enemies as Christians, right? If you're a Christian today and you're listening to this, you would think we don't talk about our enemies a whole lot because enemy is a harsh word, right? And it doesn't seem very spiritual. You know, if you're a spiritual person, you shouldn't have enemies, right? We're supposed to be the ones that are really nice and the ones that are peaceful and get along with everybody because we're just so wonderful <laughs> and, and easy to get along with, right? Uh, I'm being very facetious here because obviously we are on the same road of traveling this and living this life that everybody else is on. We do have the Holy Spirit helping us, but we all know that none of us are perfect and we have to admit today to start this that we all have enemies, okay? If, if you don't think you have any enemies, this message will mean nothing to you. But we, the understanding is that we all do have enemies because an enemy is really just someone that opposes you, someone that actively opposes you. So we all have people that oppose us in our life. It may be somebody at your place of work. It may be somebody at school, maybe a teacher or a friend or even somebody in your friend's circle that opposes you. It could be a, 
an extended family member, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a relative that you know is opposing you and you're having a, a rift with in your life, right? And God forbid it can even be in our immediate family at times where we have people that are opposing us and scripturally speaking, that person would be considered an enemy in your life. And we are called to love those enemies. And to think that we wouldn't have any enemies is kind of funny because it's really almost impossible to not have enemies. Because as long as we have these bodies of flesh and these minds and hearts that are natural in our life, we're going to have opposition in our life. And the Bible is clear that if you're gonna live out your life on this earth, you're going to have enemies. In fact, Jesus said in John 16, he says that there will be people that think they're doing God a favor by killing you. In fact, we're seeing that all over the world, right? You don't see that so much in the West. The, the most opposition we're gonna get, the most enemies we're gonna get because of our faith is typically just someone that doesn't want anything to do with your faith or makes fun of you maybe a little bit or tells you they don't want to hear about your Jesus, right? But in other places in the world, there are people every day that are killing Christians because they think they're doing God a favor by killing them and getting rid of them. So we're going to have enemies in our life, especially if we live a life of faith. And if we live a life according to the word of God and trusting God with our life. You've heard the phrase, keep your, your friends close, keep your enemies closer, right? And that term is, is basically used to mean, you know, you wanna, you wanna know what your enemies are up to. You don't wanna turn your back on your enemy, you wanna keep them close so you can keep an eye on them so they can't get the upper hand on you, right? And I suppose there's some wisdom to that in some situations, but if that is our motto, and we're just wanting to keep an eye on them to make sure they can't get us, then we're really missing the heart of the gospel. We're missing the heart of the word of God because we are called to actually love them. We're called to actually live in such a way that we would be a blessing to them, and that is madness in the world. It's even madness to a lot of us in the church that when we think about this or we read this, we just kind of disregard it. In fact, many times, I think if there's any verse in the Bible that we'd like to run a Sharpie through, this is probably one of them, right? To love our enemies. I mean, the best we can offer on our own is to maybe put up with them. You know, is there, there, there's verses in the Bible that sometimes you read a certain text and you actually, it's hard to understand it. You know, you read it and you, you think, man, I don't even know what that means. And so you kind of end up, you having to do some research, you look at some commentaries and some studies and try to figure out what it actually means for your life today. Then there are other verses that you read and you know exactly what it means right away, but it's very difficult to live out. This is one of those verses. It can be incredibly difficult to live this verse out because it flies in the face of everything that's in our nature. I mean, that he's, Jesus said to, if someone slaps you in the face, to turn the other cheek, let them slap the other cheek too. Now, I don't know anybody ever that that is in their nature, right? Somebody smacks you upside the face, whether it's literal or figurative, to just say, oh yeah, that's good, go ahead. Just do a little lighter on this side, right? Nobody, that's not in our nature to even think about wanting to be that way. And the best we can offer is to just not respond in kind, right? But most times we want to respond in kind. But Jesus says that we are to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. And if, if it wasn't bad enough, you know, that he said, turn the other cheek, if they, you know, if a Roman soldier forced you to carry his, his, his gear with you for a mile, which they could do that back in Jesus' day, they could tell a Jewish person, you gotta carry my stuff for a mile. He says, don't even just do it a mile, do it two miles. So not just doing nice things and not responding negatively, he blows the roof off all of it and says, oh, by the way, I want you to love them. I want you to love those enemies. And in Jesus' day, this would have been a completely unheard of concept. In fact, when he's preaching this sermon on the mount and he said these words about loving your enemies, he most likely offended a lot of people because it went against everything they'd ever been told. Because Jesus even said, he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, the reason he said you've heard it said was because that is how they were taught. The scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the day, they were actually teaching this philosophy, to love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Now they got half of it right. They took the love your neighbor part from the law. It was in the law in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. It said very clearly, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. 
And notice in that verse though, it says, don't do it against one of your people. So they took that to me. Well, if he's talking about our people, that means the people that aren't our people, which are our enemies, we can hate them. So that's what they were being taught. And let me tell you, they were good at it. They were really good at hating their enemies. In Jesus' day, they wouldn't even associate with the Romans or the Samaritans or any other people group in that they were coming in contact with. They wouldn't even eat with them. You'd get in trouble for eating with somebody that was not a Jewish person. So they were very, very good and well accustomed to hating their enemy. And Jesus comes in and says, no, 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 no. Not only do you need to put up with them, I am expecting you to love them. This is the way of God. And this would have been very difficult for them because this was a teaching that was completely contrary to what they'd been told by the people they respected the most. I mean, what if I came in here on a Sunday and said, listen, guys, I know we've, you've heard all this teaching about, you know, you're supposed to be generous as a Christian. You know, you should give some back to God. You should be generous with people in your life. Take care of your, your family, anybody in need, you know, help the poor, do these things. Be generous with what God's given you, you know, because it's all from him. And just forget all of that and just keep it all for yourself. Now, some of you might rejoice from that. I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. Not if you got the spirit of God, right? But if I would say, no, forget all that. It's your money. You should keep it. Don't, don't be. The people that need it, it, they got in the situation they're in because of their own bad decisions. It's their problem. You just keep what you got and hoard it and build up a good, nice, big savings account so you can retire at 50, right? Now, you guys would all look at me and think I was absolutely crazy. And you would probably be offended. Now, the difference between what I'm saying and what Jesus said is what Jesus said is actually true. What I'm saying is a bunch of hokey. But you get the idea that when you've heard something your whole life and all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, no, no, that's actually wrong. Do it the other way. Com not, just, not just tweak it, complete opposite of that. That would have been a hard word for them to hear. The funny thing is, it's a hard word for us to hear today too. No matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how long you've been going to Sunday school and hearing the words of Jesus, and you've maybe done studies on the Sermon on the Mount and read all the things, the blessings that Jesus talks about and all the things he said in this sermon, it's still a challenge to really live this out. It's much more in our wheelhouse to be offended or to give payback or to do one of the other things, anything other than actually loving those people that have hurt us in our life. So why is Jesus being so provocative? Why can't he just kind of let us just kind of go on our merry way and, and do the best we can? Why would he go into this madness well, to answer that, I think we'd have to answer another question first. What is the best that we could do on our own? As, a, as just a person, what is the best response you could hope for with your enemies? Is it to actually just put up with it? To kind of ignore it? You know, in today's age, maybe not following them on social media so you don't have to see all the stuff that's going on in their life? Not obsessing about them, right? Because I think we're guilty of that sometimes. What is the best we could hope for to respond to the enemies in our life? Is it just keeping our mouth shut when that person's brought up and not slandering them? The reality is those are all good, but those are not enough. Why does he say that we have to love them? Well, I'll give you a few real quickly, a few reasons that I believe that are from the scripture. First of all, it shows who you are. Jesus said to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, for such are, or that you may be sons of your father in heaven. Now, just reading this on the surface, it looks like he's saying, you love your enemies and then you'll be part of God's family, right? If you love your enemies, you could be part of God's family. When reality is, does loving your enemies make you part of God's family? No, not at all. Well, what makes us part of God's family is when we step into faith in Jesus, when we have the realization and the conviction in our heart and realize that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior and I'm gonna trust him for the forgiveness of my sins and I'm gonna walk this life out in faith in Jesus. That's what makes us a child of God, right? We, we, are, we become a child of God because of grace through faith. It is a free gift that no man can earn. So loving your neighbor does, or loving your enemy doesn't earn you being part of the family of God. So what's he saying here? What he's actually saying is that when we love our enemies, we are showing evidence that we are children of God. We are proving to ourselves and to everybody else that I am a child of God because I react differently in situations than someone who is apart from God would in the same situation. It shows us to be children of God. So basically, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is not optional. 
It's not an option. But the beauty of it is you don't do it on your own, right? This is, we don't do anything in his faith on our own. God gives us his spirit to empower us to live through us, to be able to do this. We talked last week about weakness. And if you say, well, you know what? I'm too weak to love my enemies. Good. That's exactly where he wants you to be, is to be too weak to love your enemies. Because when we admit that and we embrace that, then we allow the power of God to come in us and help to do it for us and with us. It shows us to be sons of God. It's also because loving our enemies is an opportunity to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. It is an opportunity to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. You have the ability to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. Did you know that? God wants the kingdom of heaven to expand on the earth and he uses his people to do it. And it's not only just something that he says, I'd like for you to do it. He says, you're going to do it. It's a command that he has. So when we love our enemies, it helps bring the kingdom of God to earth. I, I've been saying it as long as I've been the pastor here and as long as God gives me breath and the incredible privilege of being on this platform on Sundays, I will continue to say it. God is about his glory first. He is about his purposes first. He is about his will first. And he is about his kingdom first. Now, does he love you? Did he die for you? Does he want you to come in and be part of his family? Absolutely. But let me tell you something, church. The day that we stepped into that faith relationship with Jesus, the day that we be, walked into salvation, we went from being about our business to being about our father's business. That's, that's a fact. That's, that's exactly what God has called us to do. It doesn't mean he doesn't bless us. It doesn't mean he's not good to us. He's a good father. There's all kinds of perks, if you will, about stay, walking in faith. But I can tell you that our number one priority as a Christian is not for our own well-being. It is for the kingdom of God. And until we get that in order in our life and understand it and live it, we will live frustrated as a Christian. We will live miserable. You'll be on a roller coaster. You'll have ups and downs. And everything will be, you'll be, you'll be struggling with doubt and questioning things. But when you look at everything in your life through the lens of it is about God's kingdom and his will first, everything starts to make sense. Now, it doesn't mean you understand everything because you will never understand everything until we're in heaven with him. But man, when it is about him, you look at everything through that lens, it changes perspective miraculously in our life. That you know what? If, if I want God to heal me of something, if he heals me, it's for his glory. If he doesn't heal me here, it's still for his glory because I get healed in heaven. Everything is about him and his glory, everything. And that's exactly what loving our enemies is about. It's about bringing glory to him in this life. You might say, well, but it's hard to love my enemies, God. Yep, duly noted. Nowhere ever in the word of God will you find God say to us as part of his message to us that, hey, get saved and your life's gonna be easy. Nowhere. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's harder. Because if you could just live your life for yourself, I mean, you could be selfish and lazy and just kind of do enough just to get by and live to please yourself. There, to some degree, it's easier. When you live this life of faith, you're not living for yourself anymore. You're living for him. And then not only that, when you start living for him, he starts to give you the, the commission to live for others too. I've said, I say it all the time. When, when, you live, when you're living outside of faith in God, you're the center of your universe. You're number one. When you live in faith and you live a life for Jesus, you're not only num not number one, you're not even number two. You're third on the list. It's him and then others and then you. And so it can be a challenge to live this life of faith. But we have to know that going in. And when we know that, then we can see, okay, love my enemies. Okay, God, I don't know how I'm gonna do that. You're gonna have to help me. And he says, good, I would love to help you. That's what I do, actually. I specialize in that. And he'll be wonderful to bless us in that. First Peter 2.12 it says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and what? Is it, does it say carry you around on their shoulders chanting your name? You know, we do such good things that the pagans see us and put us up on their shoulder and start chanting, Reagan, Reagan. That'd be kind of cool. It'd actually be really embarrassing if I'm honest, but... But that's sometimes what we think. Oh, look at all the good, stuff, good deeds I'm doing. You know, even for my enemies, I'm doing good deeds. We can't even seek to love our enemies because we think it's gonna make us feel better. Peter says here, you love your enemies. You, you, 
you live lives among the pagans that are so good that they will what? They will glorify God on the day he visits. Even that, even your good deeds, even living so good that people outside of faith have to take notice, it's not even for you, it's for him. And it says it will glorify God on the day he visits. When is Jesus visiting? It's when he comes back. It's when he comes to take his bride, take the church with him, right? The second coming of Jesus. So what it's saying here is that these people will glorify him on the day he visits. So what he's actually telling us is that you're living a life in such a way where you're loving your enemies and you're living in accordance to the word of God that it can actually be a tool of evangelism where people can get saved to where they will glorify God on the day Jesus comes back because they get to go with him. You know who goes with Jesus when he comes back? The sheep. The Bible says he's gonna separate the sheep and the goats and the goats are going to eternal damnation. The sheep are going with him. So if they're going with him and if they're gonna glorify him on that day, they gotta be sheep. Not, many of us would say, I'm not much of an evangelist. I'm not good at sharing my faith. If I told you you had to go door to door witnessing this week with 10 neighbors, you'd probably say, well, this is my last week at New Hope. <laughs> we get nervous to share our faith sometimes with, with words and expressing it to people that don't have the same faith as us, right? So we don't always evangelize. This is a form of evangelism. Loving your neighbors is a form of evangelism. Now, is it 100% foolproof that every time you do good deeds to those who persecute you and are, are bad to you, that they're gonna get saved every time? Of course not. There's no foolproof thing out there. But this is a way, biblically, that God says you do this and those people will glorify him on the day that he returns. If we would just get out of the mindset of just trying to not have enemies and living our life to make, try to make sure we don't have enemies and really just understanding that you're going to have enemies because there are gonna be people that oppose you and letting God use that for his glory, it will change everything. It will change everything. Don't seek to eliminate your enemies, seek to love them and see God be glorified through it. Also, another reason we do it is because reward. Now, I purposely mentioned this one last because it's the least important. This should not be what motivates us to do what the word of God tells us to do, but there is fruit that comes from it. He says in my text verse, he says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Even the tax collectors do that. Jesus is saying there's a reward for those that it, when you love those that don't love you. Now, what is that reward? I don't know exactly, but that's okay. If the, if the God of heaven and earth is telling you you're gonna get rewarded for loving your enemies, that's enough for me. Even if I don't know what it is and I don't see it today, it's still enough for me to know that I'm going to be rewarded. First Peter 3, 9, look what Peter says. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So when we don't return evil or insult, but we bless, basically if we love our enemies, we will, be, we will inherit a blessing. Now this is a little ambiguous, the blessings of God, right? I don't know exactly what this blessing looks like either. It'd be, be a lot easier if it just said, you do these things and you will, uh, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a million dollars. I think we'd all, it'd be really easy to love our enemies. I'd probably love them once a week. Maybe twice a week. That'd be a nice, you know, nice little cash cow to have there. But you know, it's funny because that is true. If we knew like, oh, you do this, I'm gonna put, all of a sudden you're gonna have all these zeros in your checking account. But the reality is the blessing that comes from God that's a spiritual blessing is so much more valuable than any money could ever be in our life. Even if we don't see that blessing until we're with him in heaven, it's still worth it. Because you're gonna get, any blessing you get in heaven is for eternity. A blessing here lasts for the duration of your short life that you have here on this earth. So it's worth it anytime we have any kind of blessing that comes from God. And if he's telling us he's gonna bless us, I can trust him that it's gonna be good whether I could see it or not. And I had a chance to live this out um, a while back. This is a while ago now. It was when Joy and I were pretty newly married. Um, we, had, uh, we had our first child. We were pretty broke. We came out of missions work, you know, and just doing what young married couples do, just struggling along. And, and, uh, but we had to get another vehicle because the one we had wasn't very good. And we were driving a baby around. We wanted to get something. So we got a vehicle. And I said, well, you know, we'll offset some of that cost. I'll sell the other one. And so I put it in the paper. And that tells you how long ago it was. There was a newspaper still that you could advertise cars. And uh, first day, a guy calls me and he says, hey, I work for a church here in town. He mentioned the name of the church. And he said, we really need a, just kind of a runaround car for our nursery. And I said, oh my goodness, 
this is from God. I'm, I'm all about helping the church. Yes, definitely. He even, he even got me to come down my price a little bit because he said it was for the church. And then, so he comes that night to get the car. And he walks in, he says, man, I totally didn't have time to go by the church to get the church checkbook. Is it okay if I give you a personal check? And I said, oh, it's for the church. Yeah, no problem. And uh, you know, I was in my 20s, pretty naive, and I'm sure you've already figured out what happened. It was a bad check. He was, he was a con artist. Um, I, in fact, I called the courthouse in the county he lived, and, and uh, when I told them his name, the, the lady on the, other line, on the other end just said, oh no. I was, I was on a long list of people this guy scammed. And, uh, but I had his phone number, I'd call him, and I'd you know, talk to him, and he would answer even, and say, oh yeah, I'm sorry, you know, that check was bad, but I'm gonna get you another one next week, and you know, just kept kicking the can down the road. And it didn't take me long to figure out that uh, I was never gonna see a nickel of that money. He basically stole my car from me. And uh, I was angry, as you can imagine. And uh, I had thoughts in my head that I would never share from this stage because they were not good. And uh, I actually had friends willing to help me um, take care of those thoughts in my head that were not good. Um, in fact, I remember telling Joy about it and I was like, what do you think? And she goes, are you crazy? Thank God for a level-headed wife, right? Um, Cause I mean, it just, it messed with every emotion I had, you know, like I was angry cause it was an injustice. Plus this guy just totally manipulated me and messed me over. And I was mad at myself for letting him do it. And, uh, I was frustrated and this went on for, man, I don't know now it's been a while, but I feel like it was probably a couple months, right? At least. And I, you know, I knew I wasn't getting anything. And I, I finally, I realized in my heart, I was going to have to call this guy and release him. I, I, I love Jesus. I know what his word says. And I know that I have to make this right in my own heart so that this does not affect me the rest of my life. And I called him one day and I said, hey, I just want you to know, I know what you're doing, I know what you did, and I want you to know I forgive you. Now I did tell him too, I said, one day, I said, I'm a Christian and I'm gonna forgive you and let this go, but I said, one day you're gonna do this to the wrong person and something bad's gonna happen to you. So I just wanna warn you about that, it ain't gonna be from me, but one of my friends might do it, but it won't be me. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, even in that, he said, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to pay you. I'm still going to pay you. I'm just working on the whatever, you know, and I just, I said, no, just forget it. And I, I forgave him, I hung up, and I've never heard from him or seen him ever again. But I know what God's word says, and I know that there is a blessing when we do not return evil for evil or insult for insult. And I know that the Lord has blessed me. Now, what does that blessing actually look like? I don't know. I mean, he blessed me with a wife and three kids and a home and a, and a great business that I had for a while, and now I'm pastoring a church, maybe that, who knows? I don't know, I don't have to know. What I know is that I'm blessed by my God because I honored his word. And I didn't do what I wanted to do. I did not want to turn the other cheek in that setting. But when we trust God in that, we can do that. So let me give you quickly, I wanna give you three ways that you can love your enemies, okay? These are things I just felt like the Lord put on my heart as I was praying through this. And one of them is to kill them with kindness. Now, make sure you say those last two words, okay? <laughs> Kill them with kindness. Okay? We all know what that means. That's about coming in the opposite spirit, right? When somebody does something wrong to you, instead of returning evil for evil, we come in the opposite spirit with kindness. And what that can actually do is it can kill your enemy in the sense that it will kill that hatred, it can kill that rage, it can kill the, the opposition sometimes when we come in the opposite spirit. And uh, what we're doing here is instead of reacting to a situation, we're responding, right? To react is to, is to say something, do something in the heat of the moment based on our emotions, right? You react when your kid does something that annoys you and you snap at your kid or whatever, you know? That's, that never works out well. That's never typically coming from the spirit of God in you. But when we respond, that is about taking a moment to step outside of the emotion of the situation and seeing what God would have you do in a situation. So we respond and not react. And this is a principle that we understand when we talk about coming in the opposite spirit. We understand this in the natural, but we can overlook it in the spiritual, right? In the natural, we get it. Like if there's, a, if there's something catching on fire, okay, we know you gotta come in the opposite spirit of that fire if you wanna put it out. You're not putting that fire out by bringing some more fire and adding it to it. You gotta do something opposite, which is water. You spray water on it, puts the fire out, right? Or darkness. If there's darkness in a room, you come into a room with no light on, you're not getting rid of that darkness by bringing more darkness into the room. I know you can't carry darkness, but you know, go with me here. The way to get the darkness out of the room is to flip on a light. The light pushes out the darkness. 
So we understand that in the natural, but man, we could overlook it in the spiritual, but it's the same principle. It's the same application in life that we need to come in the opposite spirit. That's why Peter said, don't return insult for insult or evil for evil. Because it's not gonna help the situation, it's going to escalate it. Now granted, sometimes we don't care, we just are frustrated, but that's why we cannot react. We need to make sure that we actually respond. Romans 12 and verse 20. In fact, in verse 19, he says, basically says, don't take revenge on someone, okay? And then in verse 20, it says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So just like you can't get rid of fire with fire, and you can't get rid of darkness with darkness, you cannot get rid of evil with evil. He says, overcome evil with good. So a couple things he says here. He says, don't take revenge in verse 19. We're not gonna overcome evil by taking revenge. We might make you feel better for a minute, but ultimately, if you were living a life for Jesus, you're gonna eventually have to go back to that person and apologize, and it can be way worse than if you didn't take revenge in the first place, right? And what happens is if you take revenge, you start becoming the person that you hate. You know, if I would have taken revenge on this guy that took my car, I was becoming who he was. In fact, Joy even said, like, some of what, you know, goes through your mind is stuff that would really would be illegal. It's like, then you get caught and you end up in jail and he's laughing at you, right? And you become the person that you are in opposition to if you take revenge. And he says, you'll heap burning coals on their head. I know some of you are thinking, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. Pour some hot coals on those guys' heads. That's not really what it means literally. What this means is, back in, back in the day in Egypt, they would put a, a pan on their head with burning coals in it and walk around as a sign of repentance. If they were, rep if they were repenting for something, this would be a way to, to publicly show that they were repenting of something. And it would literally be a pan with coals burning coming out of the top of the head there. And so what he's saying here is you'll heap burning coals on their head. Basically, you will be heaping conviction on the person by not doing what they were doing and by trusting God in this. You're actually... Uh, quenching the situation. You're actually helping them to see the error of their way if we will feed them when they're hungry and we will go the extra mile and give them a drink when they're thirsty and not returning the evil for evil. And then he says, overcome evil with good. And really, this is what we want, right? We want good to overcome evil. But the problem is too often we envision it like in the movies. You know, when good overcomes evil in the movies, the guy in the movie always dies. You know, or, or gets to go to jail, or at the very least, if it's like a rom-com, it gets humiliated, right? But there's always this, this thing of like, feeling like, yeah, he got what was coming to him, right? That's not the good overcoming evil that the Bible talks about. It's about giving him a drink when he's thirsty. It's about giving him something to eat when he's hungry. It's about not returning insult for insult. It's about blessing. That's how we overcome evil spiritually, the way God has designed it for us. So we have to make sure we have the right perspective and we're not approaching it like Hollywood does or how many other people would do, but doing it the way the Word of God would say. All right, secondly, a way we love others, love our enemies, is to remember that there are two sides to every story. Remember that there are two sides to every story. You know, being in ministry, I've heard lots and lots of stories. I still, I hear them all the time. And you know, when I was younger in ministry and I would hear a story, and someone would come and say how outraged they were and how offended they were because this other person, you know, did something to them and they can't believe they did that to them and how could they mistreat me like that? I, was, I didn't do anything to them and I'm sitting there listening to them and I'm taking up their offense and I'm frustrated too and I'm thinking this is the worst human that's ever walked the earth, right? And then all of a sudden, you have an opportunity to actually talk to that person, you hear their side of the story and you go, huh, actually that person's pretty bad too, right? Almost 100% of the time, there are two sides to every story. Even in your own story, guys. Even in your own story. Except in mine. I was 100% right when my car got stolen. 99% of the time, there's two sides, right? Uh, there's, but there's, uh, the, the thing we have to do in these situations is try to put ourselves in that other person's shoes, right? Look at the situation, not react, but respond. Remove the emotion from a situation. Look at yourself. Be honest with yourself in the situation you're in. I've, I've been in enough situations where I've been, you know, I had a, an enemy 
And when I'm in my, you know, my pride and my emotions say it was all them, 100%, I'm a total victim here. But when I've given myself a moment to step outside of that and say, okay, why did they do that? Almost every time there's something that I could have done that maybe provoked it, or I'd even just did something in error. You at least get a place where you get some perspective and you realize, okay, at least I can understand why they did that. They're not the worst human on the world, right? I mean, a great uh, arena for this is in family and in marriage, you know? The, as a husband and wife, marriage is wonderful, but there's definitely times of opposition, you know? Me and Joy call it heated fellowship. Uh, <laughs> makes it sound Christian and spiritual. It's usually not very spiritual, though, but uh, doesn't happen often, but, you know, every, every marriage has those things, you know? And, and there have been times where we've had these discussions, these, these fellowships, where I've walked away going, man, how could, she, how could she treat me that way? How could she not see that I was right? You know, she's being, she's being irrational, you know? And, um, but when I step aside and look at it from the outside or even maybe come back together with the emotions removed and she can share her heart and I realize, oh, I'm actually quite a jerk, you know? Or I at least see her side of it, you know? And um, it's so important that we do that so that we can have some understanding. And when we understand that there's two sides to every story, we can see that, okay, it can, it can just help bring the ability in our life to be able to love that person. You know, Jesus didn't say that there's not evil in the other person, but there's also not, not that there's not evil in us. You know, we were, well, apart from God, the Bible says that our hearts are restless evil. So it's in us too. Okay, I'm not saying we're like got demons in us. I, what I'm saying is the flesh nature that each one of us has is in opposition to God, which makes us an enemy of God. In fact, Romans 5 verse 10, it says, for if when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now received reconciliation. So what he's saying here is that we were enemies of God, and while we were his enemy, he loved us. That's why Jesus can say, love your enemies, because he did it too. See, I think sometimes if, we, if you've been saved for 50 years or even 30 years or 10 years, it's easy to forget that we were enemies of God. And we get this idea in our head that we were just always saved. You forget about how it was before you loved Jesus. But you know, Jesus died for you for that person you were before you met him. He didn't wait for us to be good. He didn't wait for us to say we're sorry. He didn't wait for us to shape up. While we were still enemies, he came and did it for us. And I love this verse because it says that we have been reconciled to him, but it says that we received reconciliation. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything to make it to where he had to do it. We received it as a free gift that he did for us because of his great love for us. If that's how he reconciled us back to him, why would we think it'd be any different for us to reconcile the relationships in our life? Now, don't get me wrong. Not every relationship, not every enemy can be reconciled because reconciliation requires both people coming back together in humility and working it out, okay? We don't need to be in relationship with these toxic Sometimes things can be incredibly toxic. We can love those people from a distance. We're not forced to be in putting ourselves in situations that are toxic and detrimental to our life. So please don't take me wrong here. There's, loving your enemy doesn't mean like, well, no matter how horrible you are to me, I'm just gonna stay by your side. Wisdom would say you have to remove yourself at times, but we could still love them. And then third and finally, a way to love our enemies don't be predictable, be remarkable. Little catchphrase, little, little tweetable phrase there. Don't be predictable, be remarkable. You know what's predictable with our enemies? Hating them, getting revenge, talking smack about them when they're not around, following them on social media, hoping to see something bad happening to them. Right? That's what's predictable. How many, uh, how many of us are guilty of all those things, I think probably all of us are at some point, sometime in our life, maybe even right now. Maybe we even hope for them to fall. 
And that is what is so predictable in our society and in our nature. But Roman, or Proverbs 24, verse 17, it says, do not gloat when your enemy falls. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. Can I tell you today, church, I'm not here to condemn us, but there's no place in the life of a Christian for us to be glad when our, those people we don't like in our life have problems. There's no place in the life of a Christian for that. And when it comes in and we feel it, we need to reject it quickly. We do not need to rejoice in our heart when those people have bad things that happen to them. Gloating is incredibly predictable when our enemies fall, but it is a complete opposite of what God would want for us. And frankly, if you're in that situation where you could gloat if they fall, that means you're also seeing when good things happen and, and it feels like with your enemies, when you want them to fall, everything good that could happen happens to them, All right? They're the one getting the promotion. They have the perfect family. They're beautiful family and you know, they got a new car. They, they got great vacations and everything's just going their way, right? And it's, and it's for us to be able to gloat when bad things happen, we have to be able to, we're seeing when good things happen too. And that is exactly the opposite of what God would want for us in our life. He has called us to love them so that we would show and prove that we are sons and daughters of our heavenly father. I wanna challenge you today as we close. Jesus said in my text verse, he said, uh, he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, praying for people, that praying for your enemies is an incredibly powerful tool that God gives us. He doesn't say to pray for them just because, you know, it's just the right thing to do. That's part of it, but it's also something that brings power into your life to change your heart in that situation. Prayer is a powerful thing. And let me tell you, when, you, when you're praying for something, someone, it's hard to not have a heart for them. That's why I think it's so hard to pray for, or it's so important that we pray for our politicians, especially the ones you don't like. Pray for them. Because rather than just hate them, then all of a sudden you find yourself having a heart for them, even if you don't agree with them. And you, when you start to pray for someone, it changes your heart towards them. Your, the rage goes away and you start to have concern for them. And it's a powerful thing and it's something each and every one of us can do. So I wanna challenge you today to take the next 30 days to commit each day for the next 30 days to pray for your enemies. I mean, we have such an incredible advantage in the era we live in right now because we all have cell phones and they all have alarms on them. Just go in your cell phone, set an alarm for noon or six o'clock or nine o'clock and have the label on the alarm say, pray. And just take 60 seconds and pray for your enemy. And now don't pray for God to get them, okay? That's not the kind of prayer we're talking about. I've tried that, it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> no, pray God's blessing on them. Pray God's favor on their life. Pray that if, if you know they're into something or there's something going on in their life that they need God's intervention, pray that God would intervene. Pray that God would bless them. Pray that God would use them. Pray that, pray that your re relationship with them could be healed. I mean, you could do all that in 60 seconds. It's such a small commitment. But I promise you, after 30 days, it'll, your heart will be different. It'll be, I'm not gonna say you're gonna be like, oh, praise God, I love them so much now, I can't even imagine how much I love them. Not everybody's gonna have this, this complete transformation, but it will affect your heart towards those people. And if there's more than one person, pray for all of them. Pray for them. So I'd like for you to, even before you leave today, get out your phone, set an alarm. It's so easy to do, it requires minimal commitment, and it can be life-changing for us, amen? Let's do that this month. Would you stand with me, please, and I'll close. God wants us to love our enemies because it'll be a blessing to the kingdom of God and it'll be a blessing to us. There's nothing better than for me to be able to talk about this guy that stole my car and have no hatred towards him, no anger. I, I don't, in fact, I had thought about him in so long when I was preparing this, I actually Googled his name to see if I could find him. And, I, and the name is fairly common, so I think there's quite a few of them. And one of them actually said it was the, that he was in prison. And it actually hurt my heart. Now you might think I was looking at that going, I hope that's him. But I wasn't. Like, I don't want him, he had a wife and two kids. 
my hope is like I would see him that he was a pastor, you know, that he got saved. And I don't know if I, I didn't, I didn't really find him, but there, it is so freeing to be able to think about those people that have been enemies in your life and to say, I really want God's best for them. I really want God to minister to that person. I really want God to heal them, heal their marriage, save their soul, bless their business or their, their job, whatever. To be able to feel that from your heart. But it doesn't come by just saying, well, I hope it happens one day. Time will heal all my wounds. That is a load if there ever was one. That is not how it works. We have to be intentional, especially with our enemies. So let's pray. If you wanna come to the altar, you are more than welcome to come if you wanna come up here and just pray on your own. But I wanna pray for all of us. And I encourage you to respond to this challenge starting today. Amen, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you so much for your word. God, we would be so lost without your word. It is what transforms us. And Lord, I know there are people under the sound of my voice today that have darkness in their heart because of an enemy in their life. Lord, I pray that you would do a supernatural work as only you can do. God, we cannot love our enemies without your help. So I pray, Lord, that your power would be manifested in our lives to love the unlovable, to love the ones that have wronged us, to have a heart for them, God. Lord, help us to take this life of faith seriously, that it is not just about what we can get out of it, but it is about what, uh, that our lives would be living examples of your goodness and your mercy. Lord, after what you have done for us, how can we not give everything for you? Be glorified in our lives, Lord. Be lifted high, be exalted. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives just as it is in heaven. Because Lord, we know when your kingdom comes in our life, it will affect the people in our lives. So Lord, today we bless our enemies. We bless them in the name of Jesus. We pray your favor on them. We pray your blessing. We pray, God, that you would meet them in their place of need in a powerful way, Lord. And for those of our enemies that don't know you, God, I pray you would reveal yourself to them in the mighty name of Jesus, that they would experience your grace and mercy just like we did. For your glory, God. We love you. We thank you for loving us so, so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Praise God. I really, really wanna encourage you to take this challenge this month. Don't, don't wait till tomorrow. Put it in your phone. It's easy to do, and it will affect you in a powerful way. I believe God will use it.